Okay, welcome to our BLI LAMP seminar. Uh, it's a pleasure today to introduce our speaker, Goltikin Golson, who is actually here at UCI. Goltikin has appointments in uh, physics, BME, um, and electrical and computer engineering. And did I miss one? And radi radiology. Yeah, <laughs> sorry. <laughs> uh, so, Goltikin does a lot of optical imaging and combines it with some more traditional uh, imaging methods like um, CT and MRI and so forth. So, um, you know, given his uh, overlap with a lot of what we do here at, at Beckman, I thought it'd be great if he could come and uh, describe what he does. In addition, uh, Goltikin is um, closely involved with the work at Lumatron and uh, hopefully will be um, helping UCI faculty to be able to use this Lumatron machine that we hope to purchase uh, soon. So, Goltikin, thank you and thank welcome. You. Thank you, Tom, for the introduction. I hope everybody can hear me. Um, hi, everybody. So I think some of you know me already. I have been here for 20 years, quite a bit long time. So, um, and... Uh, my title is the true, true multimodality optical molecular imaging. I want to focus on the two new technologies that we de developed at UCI and patented here. But before that, I just want to go 20 years earlier, and then I will just want to give you some kind of like a history of our lab. I think that will kind of like also bring you up to that what we are, what we are doing. I'm an associate professor in the Department of Radiological Sciences, as Tom said. I have joined a program in engineering because most of my PhD students are from BME, physics, and uh, ECS. As you can see, our lab is very hands-on. We build instruments. 70% of our work is building. The re remaining 30% is the reconstruction, image reconstruction. Once you get the data, you have to re reconstruct an image, right? And this it's one of the hardest parts of our research. Um, let's see. Uh, Okay, I can now move. So, I have actually two heads. One of them is the professor as researcher, and the second one is I am the director of the in vivo functional long imaging shade resource of Cancer Center. So, as the director of this cancer uh, shade resource, we provide turnkey and custom imaging solutions to all UCI researchers, including the Cancer Center members. So, we have MR, optical, nuclear, ultrasound, all kinds of imaging modality in the department of radiology. If we cannot have it, we will just go and find it and then help you guys. Like, you know, that's why I'm telling this slide every, in my, all my talk. So anybody who wants to incorporate imaging, any type of imaging into the research can just call me and then we will we will do our best to help you. And uh, Farouk is here, so our manager of the core, but my right hand in our lab, our senior um, investigator in our lab, and, and he's expert in reconstruction algorithms. So uh, that way we have a complementary expertise so both instrumentation and reconstruction device. So when I come here in 2000, the first thing I did was I met with Bruce and then it's okay, what do we do? Like, you know, I, I just, I came from a solid state physics lab and the reason I came here to Immuno Functional uh, Imaging Center, uh, Dr. Nalsi also brought me because he had a collaboration with Bruce. They wanted to, integrate optical imaging into MRI. So what we did was, you know, the DOSI system by heart, I believe. So we took this DOSI system, we used long optical fibers, and then we, we kind of integrate into the MRI, which is kind of down there, if you don't know this, like if you just like for five minutes, we have two MRIs just right there near Irvine Hall. And um, <clears throat> we had some animal models, we had a red, with a breast cancer tumor model, we put the dosi probe on it inside the MRI, and we did some measurements. So um, we published many papers, and then some of the names you'll be familiar with. I think I don't need to tell you, you know, Anthony, David, Kuchia, uh, from this. But there are some names that you may not know by now. One of them is uh, Sean Merritt and Frederick Biduka, and uh, obviously Anthony. So. Um, Albert. Albert was the main driving force between the behind the dosage system at those times. So uh, thanks to them, we could complete those studies. So what we did was, as you can see, we put some fiducial markers. 
these three dots on the left and right are prudential markers that tells us where the dosi probe is. Therefore, from those prudential markers, actually, we can figure out where the optical fibers are. And then Sean and David, they put their Monte Carlo simulation on top of this MR image that shows where the signals, optical signals coming from. And then we kind of did some weighted averaging of MR measurements multiplied with this Monte Carlo result, basically the photon density. And then they kind of found the bulk properties, but kind of it was a weighted one. And therefore, we had a way to um, validate those measurements with the MRI. So you can see that we use multiple different animals, multiple different tumors. So each tumor has different heterogeneity. So from the MRI, since you know where the probes are, you can actually kind of figure out like the photon density map on each tumor. And MRI tells you the MRI can give you the water fat concentrations. And then um, DOSI also can get the water fat concentrations and hemoglobin concentrations, right? So we kind of like use those measurements, publish a couple of papers to validate the DOSI using in vivo measurements with the MRI. So that was a very successful one. We also injected indiosoin and green and metal in blue to the animal. And we could also see the enhancement kinetics with the DOSI. MRI can also do the same thing. We have an MR contrast agent, Gallium DTPA. We can inject it and then we can look at the enhancement kinetics. So depending on the heterogeneity of the tumor, the contrast agents can go, for example, to the viable part of the tumor, but not the uh, unviable or the dead part, ne necrotic part. So this gives us a very nice... Um, opportunity to validate the dosage measurements. Um, I know the BLI was really good at dosage measurements. I wanted to do, okay, I said, okay, how can I improve this? So I said, okay, the way to do is to do tomography. So, and um, that's how I started my lab. I said, okay, maybe I can kind of, dosage system was very capable because so many frequencies, so many wavelengths, but only two or three probes. I said, okay, maybe I can reduce the number of frequencies and wavelengths and improve the number of probes. So kind of like a tomographic approach. If I can get the data from multiple views, I can get 3D measurements, right? That's how we started. So the idea is when you send the near-infrared light, we are do our measurements. Then once you do the measurements all around the object, you can use some mathematical models and then we can use some numerical models too. Finite element was the choice for us because you can do irregular uh, shapes. And then from that, you can do, you can solve inverse problems if you have enough measurements and you can get the optical properties of the tissue like absorption scattering maps. So it won't be bulk numbers anymore. It will be a map. So I kind of like a special result map. And from that, you can get the hemoglobin, dioxomoglobin, water, fat and scattering maps as well. If you go to fluorescence modes, we can follow the molecular probes and get their concentration and lifetime in the same manner. So we have to solve two equations though, one for emission, one for excitation, one for emission wavelengths. And then we, all these years, we did this in absorption mode, fluorescence mode, and bioluminescence mode. Um, and then this is one of the first instrumentations that we built in my lab. So this is a diffuse optical tomography instrumentation. As you see, it's on wheels. So we could actually move this from the lab to the MRI and combine with the MRI. So um, it's pretty similar to the DOSI system, but the main differences is I was using photomultiplier tubes. I don't know whether you can see this um, mouse, but anyway, I can, we use uh, photomultiplier tubes as the sensors because when we do transmission measurements, unfortunately, photodiodes are not enough, right? We need to use the most sensitive detectors in the world. And then we find this Hamamatsu photomultiplier tubes. They were the smallest and most sensitive ones for the near infrared. We use eight of them. And then we sent the light from multiple positions, detected photomultiplier tubes, modulate the laser with a one or two frequencies, and then um, we collect the data, and then we did the image reconstruction. So we modulate the light, as you know, and then we use diffusion equation uh, for, for finite element technique to solve the inverse problem. So then we, we prepared the circular interface to place the animal inside, and then we push the fibers and make the contact inside the MRI, so when you send the light from the one fiber, we detect from all detector fibers, the black ones. And then you can imagine that if you are giving like milliwatts of power, the first detector close by will take microwatts. The second detector or the third detector will go down to nanowatts. 
and the farthest sectors will go to picobats. And I'm talking about maybe a red size animal. Um, mice is a bit easier, but red was really difficult. We were, we were forcing us to get red data. So when you have this huge dynamic range, and when you have photomultiplier tubes, what you do is either you need to change their gain all the time, or we fix the gain and instead use the filter wheel to adjust the dynamic wheel. So whenever the photomultiplier tube is getting a very high signal, we put the filter wheel in front of it, intentionally reduce the signal so that we reduce the dynamic range. Um, so you can see that, like, you know, then we change the source position. And every four source position, you get all the detector measurements. And then from all the detector measurements, at the end, you have eight by eight, 64 measurements. And then from the 64 measurements, you collect the unit image reconstruction. This is inside of the detection system where you can see the photomultiplier tubes on the bottom. There is a rotation stage that rotates the filter wheel continuously depending on the source position. And those red fibers are coming from the MRI, long 10 meter fibers that collects the data and then brings it into the system. System is RF shielded. This is the interface where we put the animals. We try so many different things. Like those are one of my students, Masset is actually, he, he did this uh, hydraulic syringes, like using this glass syringes, we try to make a hydraulic system to a and use some force sensor or pressure sensors to put same pressure on the fibers. And we try so many different things. But at the end, I will show you just one or two results so you can see what, what uh, the you know how it works. So for this animal, for example, we inject both MR and optical contrast agents, going to TP and ICG at the same time. And we did simultaneous optical and MRI measurements because we are inside the MRI, right? We can do simultaneous imaging. So you can see the cross-section of the animal, those two things you can see on the left and uh, top and right-hand side are the fiducial markers of the two probes. Once we know two probes, because they are equal angles, we can actually figure out all the source detector positions on the animal. You can see from the dense anyway. And then we make our finite element mesh. You can see the finite element mesh on the right. And then once we make your finite element mesh, now we can solve the forward and inverse problem using diffusion equation. So uh, the bottom pictures, the first one on the left shows the MR reconstruction. So the MR results. So the MR says you have high enhancement on the tumor than the, this blue a muscle area that we choose. And then when you compare the same thing with the optical data, and optics, optical data says, yes, we have much more absorption in the tumor after the injection of indocyanin and green. So kind of like a, a, there is a video, if oh, I can play this. So we inject indocyanin and green right now, and then it comes into the tumor and then clears out. Every image was 16 seconds. This was pretty much the fastest system in the, in, uh, at that time for single slice. So we could do pharmacokinetics uh, with this system. Um, and as you see, you can do the same thing with the MRI. We get a bunch of images, and then we can look at the enhancement kinetic of gadum DTPA and ICG separately, although injected at the same time and measured at the same time. They are a bit different, similar but different, which is normal because contrast agents, they are different. Molecular weight is different. Their interaction is different. So we don't expect to have the same exact um, pharmacokinetics. This gives us an idea. So we wrote this grant together with G Global Research, and then we hit this R2 on R33, a big grant. Uh, so GE made all this polylysine agents where they put the uh, gadolinum and I800 on the same, same polymer. So that gives us a kind of like a uh, ammunition that we can use. Because now we know that when we inject this to the animal, the pharmacokinetics that we measure should be exactly the same. Because it's the, the same agent that gives MR and contrast agent, right? And then we tried. So this is one animal. You can see the first of the series at the left and the last one. And you can see the MR images. There is a bit difference. The bladder is actually full. It's more brighter. You can see at the center. And the tumor is a bit brighter. It's hard to see visually. Then we did our finite element mesh. And then those are the four optical images. We get like hundreds of them, but those are selected for. As you can see, optical imaging is also say the bladder is getting more and more contrast agent and the tumor is getting brighter and brighter. So when we compare the pharmacokinetics in the tumor and bladder using MRI and optical imaging, you see they match. So it was a very nice confirmation for us that 
it gives us the con confidence that our optical tomography kind of works because we get the same. Especially when you look at the bladder, at the beginning, there is nothing. The agent starts to come to the bladder after, after a couple of minutes. And next step, we get the BCRP breast cancer, California breast cancer research program idea grant to move this to clinics. We spent some time to make this interface, as you can see. Now we have the now we have optical fiber, fiber optical bundles. They are eight millimeter bundles because breast is harder to get data, especially transmission data, right? And then we built this interface and we kind of MR compatible. We designed the MR uh, coil inside the interface. It's a special coil, custom design coil uh, that can work with this MRI. Um, and then we call those piano keys on the back. So then you use the piano keys, actually you can push the fibers and then make the contact. And then we uh, tried with a couple of volunteers. It was really hard to use, especially you can see the um, space was very tight for women. MR is already, people are already claustrophobic and then space is so tight. And then once they're on it, we push the fibers. We don't know whether they do contact or not. It's so hard to see. We try to use some pressure sensors and whatnot, like so many stuff, so much trials. And then while we do all those, and we said, okay, maybe we should completely change the design and make it more practical, like a parallel, limited view, view tomography. Like we forced us to make a full tomography region, but we got some data. And then meanwhile, there was something going on in the field. So we had this smart probes were coming. Actually, NH at those times hit this roadmap. So they wanted to, they want everybody to develop those smart cancer targeting probes. And in this case, you can see there is an MMP proteinase positive and negative tumors on the left and right for this mice. And this is an image taken from a single view with the camera. Yes, those agents, they accumulate the MMP positive one, but unfortunately, they somehow accumulate on the MMP negative one too. So they are not 100% specific, those smart probes. That's the problem of optical imaging. And especially if you think about that, if those tumors are not on the surface but deep, yes, the left one has more signal, but if it is deeper than the right one, you would see from this angle, totally different picture. You would think that the left one has less signal than the right one. So we kind of switch our system to fluorescence for fluorescence imaging, the very same system, MR compatible system. We change our design. Fluorescence signals are unfortunately like sometimes 1,000 times less. It, it, like, it was so hard for us to bring our sensitivity down there, but we could do it. Um, and then this is, we, we did, we, we, I had another one that uh, we work on the system. So here's an example. We uh, insert a surgical, surgically insert a tube in the center of the animal. We put 668 nanometer nanomole ICG with a 0 0.56 nanosecond lifetime. And then when you do reconstruction, when you get the data and do the reconstruction, those are the images that you get. Unfortunately, the problem of optical imaging is low resolution because of the scattering. When we do tomography, we get this low resolution. So the small tube looks like a big blob. Therefore, the concentration is smeared and the concentration is like 10 nanomoles. Uh, and the lifetime was also like 0 0.3, although it should be 0 0.5. What we did was we also take it after the fluorescence measurement, we took the absorption measurement first and then use them to correct the images. Because once you know the absorption map, you can correct for excitation emission uh, propagation, photon propagation. Then things get better, as you see. And the last thing is, if we assume that we can see the object from the MRI, the tumor from the MRI, then if we use this as a MR structured information, then you, as you see, we nail it. So this told us that when you do optical imaging, unfortunately, quantum accuracy is low. And unless we know where the tumor is, we won't be able to get quantumly high accurate numbers. So now it becomes like something weird because you are talking about optical tomography imaging, but actually, you are trying to go back to spectroscopy. You are using MRI as imaging, and then you are using optics to kind of sense how much agent is there, and then um, what's the lifetime. So we are kind of, we call this quantitative molecular imaging. So, which is important because like I told you, 
if you have two tumors, uh, MRP positive and negative, and then if they have different depths, you should be able to get the correct numbers. Otherwise, all the measurements will be wrong. Um, lifetime was important for us because, um, as you can see from those measurements, some external measurements, lifetime is also changing based on the tumor microenvironment. So this is the very same agent in the center of the tumor and the edge of the tumor gives different lifetime because they say a bit pH level is different. Maybe the central part is necrotic, let's say. So we have been working on this CCD camera with an intensifier, ICCD, and we try to modulate the intensifier so we can actually get the lifetime images too. And then when we work, when we work on the system, um, I had a, a chance to work with Dr. Kim from Busan University. We had this nice collaboration. My JDU was my PhD student. And then um, they developed this swept wavelength laser where you can actually, it's based on Fabry Perot to tunable filter. Um, use, you can actually kind of, for example, for this particular superluminescent style, the SOA, um, the range is from 780 to 820. It's limited. But the good thing is, by changing that there is a mirror there, it's hard to see right now, but by, by changing the mirror, you can actually kind of focus the, uh, you can actually fix the laser output to any particular wavelength. So we could actually change the wavelength from 780 to 820 with one nanometer steps. So it's kind of like a very nice thing for us. And we kind of, we were working on this and trying to integrate this to our system. So instead of doing, Fluorescence measurement using a single wavelength, we could do multiple wavelengths, and that gives us actually a quite a bit of information. And meanwhile, I had a chance to give a talk at Purdue um, because I knew somebody, and then they, they wanted to do some optical imaging. And then I met with Dr. Lowe, and Dr. Lowe is a very famous uh, biochemist, and then he has been developing so many different probes. And then there's a on target laboratory, a Purdue based company. They have been using this. They have been developing this folate targeting probes. Since I have two heads as the director of the IVFI, I kind of managed to get the phase three clinical, phase two and three clinical trials to UCI and work with them uh, as a research partner on the on our cameras and stuff. And then um, this study was completed at UCI. So there is a in interoperative camera, fluorescence camera on the top of the surgery suite, as you can see. So this is when the surgeon for ovarian cancer, when they do debulking surgery, you can see the left hand side, this is what they see. So they try to actually shave and then get rid of all this tumors, small lesions, but there are so many lesions. And the idea is you don't wanna leave anything behind, right? Then you close the patient. And the right one is when they turn off the lights and then turn on the fluorescence camera. So what they did was two hours before the surgery, they inject the folate targeting um, agents, and then they, they go everywhere in the body, but ovarian cancer is really folate expressing, expressing I think 80% ovarian cancer. So they kind of stick to the ovarian cancer and then stay there, they accumulate there. So after two hours, others are cleaned up from the body, but the ones that stick to the uh, ovarian cancer, they are there. So you can turn off the light, turn on the fluorescence camera and then you can see them. And after the phase two and phase three clinical trials, Dr. Liz Randall told me that um, there is a video here. Hopefully, you can that give you some more information. So you can see that you know how how surgeons sees them, identifies them um, on the on the screen. Uh, so after phase two and phase three clinicals are completed, doctors determined that actually this agent helps when they actually do the map. Their map is much more. Um, their map is better than the one with naked eye, naked eye map. And the company get the FDA approval in 2000, at the end of 2021. I'm going to tell you this, guys, because this is the first optical monitor agent in the market. So this is kind of my hard dream. We have been developing instruments in the last 20 years, but there was no agent, you know. So now they are coming. So you will see that maybe in a couple of years, every hospital will have those interoperative camera and they will buy the those agents. They will inject to the ovarian cancer patients during the debulking surgery. So this is kind of like the first, first step. Uh, they call it cytolux. Um, <clears throat> meanwhile, we have been working with 
some other companies, old companies, Gamma Medica and DX-ray, we hit this SPR grant to build a X-ray tomography system for small animal systems. They have been developing the X-ray tomography part. And then our job was to put the fluorescence tomography on the same system. So you can see we had a camera and then multiple lasers. And then the, this is just a prototype, right? So uh, we did some developments. This is one of my students' PhD thesis view things. And then I just want to show you a couple of results. So we inserted again tubes. Why we're inserting tubes? Because when we insert tubes, we know how much we put, how much ICG we put. So that helps us to validate our system. So we put one onto the surface of the animal, and for the other animal, we put to the center of the animal. And then you can see without the prior reconstruction, although we put 500 nanomole, reconstruction to 10 nanomole, but then we use all the anatomic and functional information we needed. So again, the same story. You need to use both structural and functional information, absorption background information to need it. And when the object is deep, as you can see, regular reconstruction cannot even reconstruct because the signals are so vague. But then when you use the absorption map, when you use the absorption map and the structural information, then you can actually need the quantum accuracy. But that's why we call quantum accurate molecular imaging. And after two companies later and one decade later, Trifoil actually make the system already. So you can see the system is in our lab right now. I'm a consultant for this company. So um, you can, as you, you see at the center, there's an imaging chamber. So you put the mice. Let's say this mice, this particular one, we, I think we hit 41 breast cancer model and uh, transfected with, with IRFP, infrared red fluorescence protein. Uh, so um, as you can see, the system first take the CT images and animal moves to the back. And there is another gantry which takes the fluorescence tomography data. And you can see the superimposed image. Uh, it's a very nice system. And they have multiple systems in different universities and whatnot. But now we are working with them. Uh, the idea is, can we use a CCD camera instead of photomultiplier tubes? That will actually can see the whole animal, so it will be much faster. It will be more sensitive because we will use in intensified CCDs. And then it can do, you can do bioluminescence tomography too. Instead of in, yeah, in addition to fluorescence tomography. So, our grant applications are under review right now. So, we have this SDTR grant. Um, we are very close, but not funded. So, hopefully, we will be funded soon. We are hoping. And actually, this two person from this company, Austin and Vesmoy, I think most of you know, <laughs> some of you know. So, they were students here. So, uh, they are still working optical imaging um, field. So, Okay, with this, these are the things that we have done. And then those, as you see, all those, we had done so much other stuff. We kind of combined nuclear imaging with MRI too. We worked on um, first animal spec system, MR compatible spec system. And then we worked with another company which kind of builds MR compatible pet detectors. We built a PAM system, post emission mammography system inside the MRI. I don't wanna, give you so much details, but we have expertise in nuclear imaging too. But when we do all this stuff, the MRI and optical imaging, they were working independently. They don't know each other. They work simultaneously, but independently. And we have been thinking all the time inside of them, right? How can we make them interact? How can we make those two imaging systems interact with each other? So then we come up with these two techniques and then we patented them. And then those are our kind of like babies. The first one is the temperature modulated fluorescence tomography. That's a combination of ultrasound and optics. And the second one is photomagnetic imaging. It's a combination of MRI and optics. But in those combinations, actually they interact with each other. That's what we like. So they work in harmony and then they kind of uh, affect each other. So uh, I should be frank. I think those ideas came after photoacoustic imaging. So at some point, I was the chair of the multi uh, uh, multimodal imaging in the SPE. We had like so many people, and then suddenly photoacoustic imaging came up, and then everybody was doing photoacoustics. So, and then I didn't want to follow photoacoustic. We said, okay, what can we do differently? And then can we kind of compete with photoacoustic in a different way? Because this is all weakness. And that's why we come up with these two, two ones. Especially photomagnetic imaging is something that we are developing to compete photoacoustic imaging. Um, 
I just want to give you like the overview of all this too. See, I have, I think, 20 minutes. I can't finish it. So, um, in the temperature emergency ultrasound tomography, we use ultrasound and fluorescence imaging. And they have, there are two main components. The first one is high intensity focus ultrasound. So, I don't know, maybe you are familiar with HIPO guys, but you can actually focus ultrasound into a bit of small small area, like 1.3 millimeters in two inch depth. So you can actually burn the tumors uh, without doing a surgery from outside. And our MRIs have a, actually MR compatible HIFO system, which might be installed soon. But we don't want to burn the tumors. We want to use them in the low power mode. And we want to increase the temperature only four degree. And the second element is the temperature sensitive fluorescent contrast agent. We call them thermodots. And then they have been developing John Hopkins first for different aim. And we saw them and then there was a light bulb. So, okay, oh my God, we can use those for imaging. So this is how we imagine and how we are using it. So basically, uh, we kind of use high foot to warm up the tissue locally. And then whenever the agent is there, their fluorescence emission changes. So that's how we kind of know where they are. So we use ultrasound to localize them, but we use optics to sense them. So that's how, how the system works. Uh, this is one of the transducers that we have. And then we tried them in the MRI. So we took a chicken breast sample. You turn the high food, you can see, you can measure the temperature with the MRI real time in 3D. You can see that we can see actually like two inch deep, around like six centimeter deep. We can see that focal, the full width half maximum of the heating is 1.4 millimeter. This, Specification of the high flow was 1.33, which is very close. This is our measurement in the MRI measurement. So uh, we work with a company, Innocence, and then um, those probes are based on the John Hopkins University, as I told you. They developed those thermodots, and thermodots is the ICG in the USA green and the pluronic polymer. So the polymer is the temperature sensitive part, and both of those are FDA approved. That's the good thing. So we thought, oh, this can be used in clinics maybe in the future, because both components are FDA approved. So you took the pluronic and then combined with the ICG. At the end, you got this thermodots. And when you change the temperature, the hydrophobicity of the this micelle changes and the quantum efficiency changes. So what does that mean? If you make it right, like you can see here, at 20 degrees Celsius, the emission is nearly zero. But when you increase the temperature only five degrees, suddenly they start getting brighter. So it's like looking at the dark sky, you don't see the stars. And then when you change the temperature, suddenly they bright, they get brighter. So you can see the stars. So, and we call them kind of like a switch because they behave like a switch on and off switches. So then we use our similar system based on photomultiplier tubes. We characterize them. You can see that when you increase the temperature a couple of degrees, the, their intensity goes up and the Interestingly, their uh, lifetime changes too. So we can actually look at the lifetime changes as well. So this is the idea. You have your source and detectors, and then you kind of do your optical tomography, and you kind of get this blobby map, because you cannot reconstruct them very nicely, but there's a blob. Then you take your HIFO, and then you kind of, in the low power, you can you scan your HIFO on this area. And then when you scan your HIFO in step and shoot mode or in we also do like so many different stuff we can do continuously. When you hit the thermodots, the signal suddenly gets higher and our detector senses. this. Now we know where they are. That's the idea, idea. So I will skip all this instrumentation detail, but this is pretty much one of the first uh, systems that we developed. We hit the HIFO sensor, optical fibers. So it's just an example. Let's say you hit this tissue simulating phantom with the center, a small object, three millimeter inclusion at the center. Then you do regular optical tomography. You get this map on the bottom. It's pretty large, not three millimeter. It's elongated because we are doing limited tomography. As you can see, we only do one view from, from top. We don't have sensors on the left and right. And then what we do is, once we figure out this area, we kind of focus the high full on the area and then scan the high full and then kind of sense it, okay, listen it or look at it. So when the signal gets bright, we know that where the, where the agents are. 
So we can actually make this binary map that you see on the bottom. And then when you use this binary map to kind of guide and constrain our reconstruction alg algorithm, we get kind of like the pretty similar result to the original phantom. So when you look at the errors, FT alone reconstruct a seven millimeter object through size about three millimeter, TMFT could reconstruct 3.2. So it's a big, big improvement. And then you kind of focus all this reconstructed object into the small area, then your quantum accuracy goes up. As you can see, the pink one is the FD. It only rec recovers one tenth of the real amount. And with the TMFT, we can actually get the, pretty much the exact amount. And we op in vivo optimized the agent, we change the polymer, so we shift the temperature towards the human temperatures, especially for animals. When you when the animals are, have the same temperatures, but when they are under anesthesia, under imaging, the temperature goes down to 30 degrees. So we try to match them. We uh, label them with a PSMA antibody. We look at their thermokinetics. We look at their thermokinetics. Thermokinetics. I'm sorry. We inject them to the animals. And because our main application was for this was the ultrasound guided hypotherapy. So image guided hypotherapy, I don't know whether you are familiar with this, some of you, I'm pretty sure you are. Um, it's also, I think it was just recently FDA approved. In other countries, it's already being done. Um, but what you see is that uh, when you have it, when somebody has a prostate cancer, so the idea is uh, you have this transrectal ultrasound probe to burn the tumor area. But the problem is you don't know where the tumor is. So you use the MR images getting like one month ago to guide yourself. But the MR images are in different positions. So they had to do lots of image co-registration and stuff. Um, and you use ultrasound, obviously, but ultrasound doesn't give you enough contrast. And then because of this poor specificity, the, the problem is the, it's really hard to do high foot therapy. And our idea was if this project goes well, you can inject the thermodust to the patients if once they're FDA approved. This is our, those are our dreams. And then now you have the hypotransducer there, right? What you can do is first you can do low power. You don't have to burn anything. You just do the high scan. And then once you know where the thermodusts are, once you figure out where the thermodusts are, because they are PSMA targeting thermodusts, you assume that they are in the, uh, they are in the cancerous tissue, equivalent to the cancerous tissue. Then you can turn your power, high for power, and you can burn that pixel only, wherever you see thermodots. You know, kind of like a teronostic image-guided therapy. So that's the thing that we are shooting for. Uh, we published these results, and then we are right now trying to get some in vivo data, and we are hoping Jared will help us. I don't know if Jared is here, but Jared Hahn. So he will help us to, because those agents, when we inject them to the animals, sometimes they don't work. We are trying to figure out why. And the second, and the second imaging model that I will tell you about the new one. So the photomagnetic imaging. This is how we come up with. So when you look at optical tomography, on the left there is a homogeneous medium, on the right there is a medium with a high absorption region. Let's say breast. Let's say this is breast, and there is a breast with a tumor. So when you send the light from the left, right hand side, the bottom maps they are showing the photon density. Okay, as you see, the photon density goes lower and lower and lower as you go away from the source. When you have an object, it disturbs your or perturbs your photon density. So when it per perturbs your photon density, your measurements on the boundary changes a little bit. This small change is what is looking for in the diffuse optical tomography. And from the small change, we are trying to reconstruct what's going on inside, which is very hard because the changes are so small. Because even this object is large and very high absorptive, the changes on the boundary in your measurements is very low. So the idea is, can you use MRI to see what's going on inside? But how, right? Because they are, uh, these are optical photons. How can MRI see the optical photons? So, so then, can we use the MRI to get measurements from the whole volume? That was our thinking. Okay, how we can do this? How we can do this? And then we find a way. And then. In this way, we use the MRI as an optical detector. So now you have your continuous wave lasers, cheap continuous wave lasers. You don't use any optical detectors, but just MRI. So how we do this? Um, 
Here, when we crank up the laser power, we can actually warm up the tissue. And we figure out that we can warm up the tissue staying under ANSI limit, like maybe one degree on the surface, sub Kelvin, maybe one inch deep. So this is a temperature phi map, as you see, the photon density map. This is the temperature map because of this phi, as you see, it's pretty proportional because the temperature at any point of the body is proportional to the photon density times the absorption. And if you have an object there, the temperature map will kind of, this will be disturbed a little bit because that object will absorb the light more if it's a high absorption object and the temperature will change a little bit more. Now the question is, can you detect the small temperature change? And then from, if you can detect it, you can actually reconstruct the object, the absorbent, absorbent object. So that's the idea of our photomagnetic imaging. So we kind of did our initial test. We put a phantom there, kind of like tissue simulating phantom. I'm pretty sure you guys are using some of them agar. We can make agar phantoms. And then we shine the light from top. And then with the MRI, we can do our temperature measurement. So we can now, we all up, up to now, we were using diffusion equation. Now it's a multi physics problem. You need to use the diffusion equation to find the photon density. Then you need to use the bioheat equation to figure out the temperature based on this photon density. So as you can see, the, the, heat, the heat part, like you know, the source part of the bioheat equation is related to the photon density times absorption, which is the first equation. So they are kind of, we need to solve them at the same time. They are linked together. That's why we call it multi physics problem, right? So can we go from MR temperature map to the absorption map? That's the idea. So there is a homogeneous object. There is an object with a, a high absorption inclusion in it. And if you subtract the temperature map, you can see that you can actually figure out where the object is. These are the real measurements from a homogeneous phantom. We turn the laser on, we get real time MR temperature every eight seconds. And then you see it warmed up and now it's cooling down. Then we turn the laser off, now it's cooling down. Cooling down takes a lot of time because there is no blood flow, nothing here, right? Because it's just a phantom. Now there's a phantom with an inclusion. Let's see whether you can actually see the inclusion. I think you could see the inclusion, right? From the real MR temperature map. And you can see if you choose the right slides, right time, you can see the temperature uh, increase in close to the object. And then when you take a profile, up to down profile, temperature profile, you can see the small dip or increase. The small increase is due to the object there, but it's very slow, it's like 0 0.2 degree. And then we spend a couple of years to kind of do this sensitively with the MRI um, to measure this small bump with the absorption object. And then we managed to do it. So this is, a, again, a small animal size phantom with nine objects. The second map is the MR temperature map. And as you see, we are sending light from top and sides. So you can imagine that top three objects are more brighter, more have more temperature because light source is closer to them. And the bottom one, especially the center one, has the less temperature, although they have the same absorption. But our forward modeling using finite element already knows this. How? Because the modeling knows the differences, the distances. And even if you start the model, I'm sending light from top and sides. This is the third, the third one is the forward solver, our forward solver, the estimated temperature map based on the light sources and absorption. So you see, they, they, they are pretty much looking alike. Why I'm showing this, if you can actually estimate this with the forward model, which means your inverse problem will be able to reconstruct the real object. And the last image that you see on the right top is the reconstructed absorption map. And we can reconstruct nine, Three millimeter, two millimeter objects with normal diffuse optical tomography, which is impossible. Only image, near imaging techniques like diffuse, uh, photoacoustic imaging can, can achieve this. So, but we can do that too. So we can actually reconstruct like the nine objects, nine small objects. If you are doing this with the regular optical tomography, you will see a big blob. There is no way you can separate them because our resolution is not enough. And then we tried the same by using an animal with the breast cancer tumor model. And then uh, when we do our reconstruction, the reconstructed chin actually kind of figure out where the tumor is, the bright area. 
So the next thing is, we want to move this to the clinical arena. So what you can imagine that, I know that I had a slide here. No, I don't. So we call, let's imagine that the woman lies down in the MRI and we kind of warm up the breast from all sides using our lasers. It's hopefully comfortable for the breast. It will be warming up a tiny bit and we will do MR measurements, MR temperature measurements. And then from there, we can actually figure out where the tumor is. So this is the, this is the idea. So now you can tell me, oh, like MR is so expensive. You are doing this, what are you doing this? You have to look from the problem from the other side. So this is what we are trying to. There are some cancer diseases, like some cancer types that patient will go to MRI anyway, right? For example, head and neck cancer. And then what we do is we just use, use our uh, cheap lasers and put a couple of fibers and then maybe add five or 10 minutes to the MRI and then get this optical absorption maps from the from the MRI. So it may be a low cost addition to the to some certain applications where the patient will go to MRI anyway. And it may help the surgeon to delineate the tumor margin or the uh, tumor type. I'm I think you are tired, but I have only a couple of slides left. Yes, I have only 10 minutes, but I have a couple of slides. So this is one of the imaging that we do for Dr. Nadine Abjuner. So she is doing taste where she inject those beads into liver tumors and then block the blood flow and kill the tumor. And then she does this on rabbits. So we brought our fluorescence camera. You can see it on the back. Faruk is there so, in our system. So, and then what we do is we inject idiocyanine green before and after she does the procedure. So this video shows the indiocyanine green perfusion map that we get from, from the liver. And the idea is you can see where the camera is looking down on the, on the rabbit. So the idea is can we kind of figure out whether she's successful blocking the tumor? Can we measure the oxygenation? Now we're adding some more lasers to measure the oxygenation. And can we longitudinally monitor the rabbits to see whether the taste procedure is successful? Because you can do the same procedure with multiple size beads. Nobody knows which one is the best. So this system can help Dr. Abhijanath to figure out which, uh, which beads are the best. As you can see, pre-taste and post-taste, our optical measurements show the perfusion difference, which confirm with the uh, X-ray measurement too. And uh, I have two, three things. This is the second one that I want to show, just, just like some flavors. So we are working with Steel Fox, Dr. Hui. So he has this animal irradiator. Um, you can put a mice there and irradiate. Uh, it is a CT system on it. So what we did was uh, we worked with um, them and UC Davis, Dr. Simon Cherry, and their group. So we installed on the same gantry our camera, lasers, pet detectors. So now this system becomes a molecular imaging system. So the idea is before beforehand, normally they always do X-ray CT and do radiation based on the uh, anatomic information. Can we use molecular information to guide them? Like you can do radiation in multiple parts, right? Then will you do the second part? Right now, they are looking at the tumor size. Instead of tumor size, can we look at some molecular changes in the background? And we can tell them, hey, now is the time to do the second dose. Don't wait tumor to get larger. So that, that may improve the radiation therapy. As you can see here, there's an animal there. You can see laser light where they shoot the uh, X-ray radiation uh, for, and then, what we do is actually Farouk is most Farouk is here mostly. Uh, he has been working on this project. He does the pixel by pixel analysis of the tumor. As you can see, those black dots they belong to the the, the tumor, the pixels of the tumor before uh, radiation. Then you do the radiation, and then you do this. I'm sorry, I don't have to. I don't have much time, but we do the PC analysis. Then you go to this PCA space. You see those blue dots. They are shifting away from the red one, black ones which means they are responding to the radiation. So we are kind of trying to figure out which part of the tumor responds to the radiation. And the last thing is, like Tom mentioned, so we hit this Lumitron, tunable monitor and like X-ray source. Dr. Barty has been leading this. Uh, so um, ideas, can we use this? They have a prototype. Can we use this prototype to get some data? 
And in the future, maybe UCI might have one of the systems. I just want to show you two slides from this. So when we use X-rays, guys, like up to now, the technology is still from 1930s. So we had those tungsten uh, targets and electrons hit the tungsten target, and then they create this Bramstrang radiation and huge uh, spectrum. You can think it's optical version is it's like a white light source. We have all kinds of wavelengths. So the idea is this technology, the Compton laser, can actually provide us the very sharp spectrum. So we can actually selectively use any any wavelength we want in the X-ray domain, which is from 10 to 100 gigatron volt at this point. So basically it's kind of like an X-ray laser. And then using this, you can do many interesting stuff. Um, we can kind of do uh, cage imaging, uh, phase contrast imaging, maybe possible in the future, time flight imaging. So the idea is, can we kind of put an uh, animal with a breast tumor cancer uh, tumor model there, put an X-ray source detector behind, and do the imaging. But during this, we can inject, for example, galenium, the MR contrast agent, with the cage around 50 kilogram volt, and then can we choose the wavelength just be below and above it? And the idea is that way you can get very high sensitive measurements. So as you know, with the X-ray imaging, I show you so many X-ray images, you, you don't have enough sensitivity. We cannot separate the, we don't have the soft tissue sensitivity. In the MRI we have, but in the X-ray we don't. But with this system, we may be able to. Uh, and the second thing is you can use the same system for therapy. So once you do the imaging and figure out where the tumor is or which part of the tumor is important for you, then you can select those areas and then crank up the power and then do the therapy. So that's why I think it's very exciting because I call this teranostic. And this, um, this has been done in cyclotrons, but now if we have it UCI, we can maybe first do the first inhibitors to this in the world. Like, you know, that will be a cool thing for UCI to do because all the studies that you will see, I have one actually example. This is my last slide. This video is so huge, it, hopefully it will work. So you see, this is an image in 2000, from 2018, collected, um, and then it took two hours to get collect this image. It's a dead animal. They have to fix the animal, and then they have this 32 micron resolution. So you get beautiful images. The problem is the time. <laughs> Uh, like, you know, when you do in imaging, you don't have two hours, right? So we have to kind of start working and then bring up to a level that we can do this imaging in maybe half an hour or so, so we can do live animal imaging. Um, with that, I want to stop here and then take you Center for Functional Onco Imaging, all this help from all these engineers, the companies we work with, funding resources, NH at the beginning. Uh, cancer Center, our Cancer Center, Susan G. Common, DOD Breast Cancer Program, CBCRP, um, some of the training grants. So uh, I just want to stop here and then uh, if you have any questions, I would be happy to answer. Thank you. Thank you, Goltkin. That was great. Um, questions for Goltkin? For uh, those breast imaging, there's multiple you know group making those tomograph. Yes. Um, some of them have been tried of in clinical trial. Have any of them get into the clinic like a, a, the as far as I device? don't know. That's why actually we stopped and then we said, okay, automatic imaging is actually very really exciting for us instead of spending energy and effort with this crampy space, all these complex detectors. When we do photomagnetic imaging, everything is much simpler, right? Because we don't have any optical detectors and it's just lasers. So now we are working on an interface for breast interface for using photomagnetic imaging. We are hoping it will be much more easy to use, no optical detectors, right? It's just lasers. And then it will be more comfortable for the patient in the MRI if she has much more space. Um, th that's where we are going right now. This is the direction that we chose. So that's why we kind of stop working on the DOT clinical measurements, yeah. And then as you know, the uh, as I show you, the resolution is a big problem for optical imaging. I mean, the power of radiology, right? When I talk to my 
uh, like friends, they say, okay, can you detect like five millimeter tumor if you don't don't even come to us? <laughs> okay, so um, we are not there yet. I don't know whether we can be there at any time if you do it. But with the photoacoustic imaging or PMI, photomatic imaging, like different techniques, I think you can achieve higher resolution. With the photoacoustic imaging, the problem is as you go deeper, resolution goes down, signal goes lower. With PMI, I didn't have much time, but the exciting thing is as long as MRI has the temperature signal, resolution is MRI resolution. So it's independent of that, as long as you have enough signal. But it's, at some point, once you don't have enough temp, uh, temperature signal, then, then your resolution goes down. So if we can get the enough signal in uh, one inch, that's what we are thinking, one inch or one inch depth, then we will have MR resolution, and then we can compress the breast into a couple of inches. So hopefully, if we illuminate from all sides, we are planning to go there with the PMI. So, not just technology. You're essentially, you essentially try to competing with mammogram, which is not perfect, but they're already doing fairly well. Exactly. Yes. And yes, uh, yes, yes, yeah. so, uh, I'm not sure um, if re resolution or other improvement were actually uh, yeah. the thing is though uh, in the last year especially the last five years because i'm the department of radiology uh, mr is used really heavily for breast cancer like some some patients if the pa patient is young if they hear the uh, history if they hear genes they just send to mri now it's now it becomes like very standard like you know so many patients goes to get get uh, mr mri breast mri um Obviously, not all of the patients, some subpopulation. Those populations, I think, we can help. So optical imaging, unfortunately, won't be replaced mammography. That's not the dream. The dream is, still though, there's some subpopulation that goes to MRI all the time. Um, when you have breast implants, for example, or if you are very young with dense breast, if you have large breast, um, then mammography cannot see anything, so they send to MRI. So for those cases, I think just the low-cost addition of from continuous wave lasers, a couple of thousand dollars each laser for us, and a couple of fibers, that's it. Um, an additional five, 10 minutes. If, if we can get some molecular information out of that, that will be great. That's what we are thinking, you know. Um, I think Jan, Jan, do you have your hand up? Or maybe, oh, that's a mouse, okay. <laughs> oh yeah that's my one minute oh. uh, thank you for the talk i just have one quick question when you did a low power ultrasound scanning for the detect the tumors area the mm -hmm. target and then when you detect it you use the high food to treat it that was kind of a strategy of from from your approach right and i just wonder how about the depth direction of the treatment or detection is it uh, uh possible so, so yeah we don't do it right now but it has been done in many many research places i think the the prostate one is now fda approval but they are doing for many different cancers but still in research like research settings uh the depth of hypho is six inch so i'm sorry it's two inches, like six centimeters, six centimeters, two inches. So you can go to two inch, two inch dips. Uh, so uh, if I don't misunderstand your question, Siri, you are asking about resolution. So maybe when we hit the high for column, uh, our resolution is 1.3 by 1.3. But in this direction, if you're asking this, if I'm not mistaken, it's yes, you are right. It's one cent. The column is one centimeter long. So, so our resolution is 1.3 by 1.3, but one centimeter in Z, right? But we hear some, now that's why actually I put a sentence there. We have an idea of using two hypo sensors, 45 degree. Then both, when those columns combine, uh, we can actually limit the resolution in Z uh, to a smaller area. It won't, I don't think it will be 1.3 as X and Y, but still I think we can bring it hopefully under maybe one, one centimeter or so. Whatever we do, unfortunately, like when you hit the MR images, MR has, we can with the MRI, we can go down to 100 micron resolution, up to 200 micron resolution, but these are all in X and Y. In Z, you always have the slice thickness. <laughs> so, so all imaging modalities, unfortunately, have this 
thing. Like, you know, this in the z direction, you have higher, lower resolution than x and y. So, but yeah, thanks for the question. Uh, we are hoping that if we use two, two PIFO sensors, 45 degree, we can eliminate some of those problems and improve the sense, uh, improve the resolution. Thank you. Other questions for Gultigan? Okay, Zoom. That's not. Okay, with that, thank you, Gultigan. Thank you very much. Thank Thanks. You.